house builders, um, but it was my job uh, to go out there and identify the development sites. I was a land buyer, and that's what I did for 30 years. And people hate me. Um, for it. the British public, they hate change, uh, and they specifically hate me. I obviously, my popularity is somewhere between Syphilis and Jimmy Savile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we refer to them quite lovingly as the NIMBYs, as we heard earlier, not in my backyard, but the NIMBYs have evolved into the bananas, which has built absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> so my epiphany was, why is the British public so ignorant about these risks? Because I know where they are. I understand the planning system. I can identify development opportunities. Surely there must be something out there that can educate people about these risks. And, and there were sort of two products that made uh, a step towards it, and that was Landmarks Plan Search Plus and Groucho Planning. But all they are is just raw planning data. Um, that nothing's interpreted within it. So we looked at it and thought we can take this a lot further than that. And if you think of planning data, any data, if it's uninterpreted, it is just a collection of data. The analogy I always give is if you were to see your doctor, and you had an ECG done on your heart, how would you feel at the end of the consultation if the doctor turned around and said, oh, I printed it off, take it home, have a brief, let me know what you think. Well, actually, no, I'd like you to go through it. You understand this. So that's exactly what we do. With planning data is included in the cost of our reports, but we go through the interpretation, and then we look at the numerous, numerous other things. Popularity, I've said that I was unpopular. The level of hatred I have experienced in my 30 years, I've been spat at, sworn at, hate campaigns, physical violence, uh, this poor lady here from Nenlis, she's actually had death threats because of a development that uh, uh, she's promoting for uh, Nenlis. So as I say, when we make them out to be having a bit of a whinge and a moan, it's not. I promise you, the British public, they absolutely despise change, especially when it's on their doorstep. So, location, location, location. It is the corniest phrase in property. But it is the most fundamental fact that contributes to the value of a property. It's all about the location. And yet we never investigate it. We take those red edging of the property that somebody's buying and we look inside those boundaries. What we do is we look inside those boundaries and outside those boundaries. So we're looking for something that could affect uh, an impact within uh, the, or the property, the value, uh, or it's just enjoyment. This is an average urban area. It's actually south of Croydon. Um, in the London Borough. Now, London Borough of Croydon is the densest borough of all the London boroughs. So you could argue, being that it's the capital city, that this is actually the densest part of the country. But, but it's everything here, coloured orange, is land that I've highlighted as being suitable for development. Everything coloured orange, there would be a presumption in favour of development in terms of planning policy, and all of those would also be economically viable for a developer to exploit. And I can prove that because I developed this one here, and these people hate my guts. I did this one over here, they hate me as well. I did one up there, and then I've done this one as well. That's just what I've managed to do since I went out on my own in 2005. Um, you imagine sort of the Simmon homes, Bellway homes, and Press Nicholson, Barclay homes, looking at this area, which they all are. There's a huge amount of risk out there. The bad news for the public is the National Planning Policy Framework. This is such a game changer. There is two elements to it. It's 27 pages of text in a 50 page document. But the most important part of it is this paragraph here, which reads, a part of the National Planning Policy Framework is a presumption in favor of sustainable development, which should be seen as a golden thread running through both plan making and decision taking. The reason that's relevant, if I take you back to here, when I developed this site here, I went to have a consultation with the council and went to the meeting, Mrs. Greenwood walks in and she says, I don't know why we're having this meeting, over my dead body are you ever going to get planning on this site? 18 months later, sadly she is still alive, but I did get planning, I got planning for 11 houses, um, she's offended, the public are offended because I knew it conformed to the house policy, but planning control and planning officers, they, they, they seem to think it's their God-given right to say no. What they're now being told because of this, if I was fast forwarding to today with Mrs. Greenwood, she would have to start that meeting with, welcome, sit down, let's talk about how we can get you planning on this site. So it's a big shift in the psychology uh, with, with councils. There's a second element to the National Planning Policy Framework, uh, and that is the five year housing supply. Every council in the country <coughs> has to have an auditable, defendable five year housing supply. So the first thing they're going to do to work out 
these, well, how many houses do we have to build? So there's a housing needs survey that's covered uh, the whole of their, their district or, 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 or parish or whatever. So let's say, let's keep it really sort of, let's say it was Leeds, and let's say they had to find 10,000 new homes over the next five years. First thing they're going to look at is all of their unimplemented planning commissions. And let's say there's a thousand plots that are yet to be built and are likely to be built over the next five years. Great, we found a thousand, 9,000 to go. Next thing they're going to look at is their uh, allocated sites that are already identified in their local plan and are likely to be developed over the next five years. So let's say they find another 7,000 plots. Right, we're up to 8,000. We've got another 2,000. Where do we find them? So Because they're actually, they've got a shortage. And if they have a shortage, there is an automatic presumption in favour of development. So let's say Leeds have only got 8,000 in a 10,000, uh, they've got a 10,000 need, but they've only got 8,000 plots. I come along as a nasty developer, identify a field. It's even in an area of outstanding natural beauty. I submit a planning application. What are the council going to do? They have to approve it. Because on balance, it is felt that the benefit will outweigh the harm. And it's a really shocking, now even though I'm pro-development because of my background, we are seeing some ghastly planning decisions being made across the whole country, and I will show you a few examples of that. Wrong way again. Bad news, 50% of open, well, over 50% of councils fail to have this five-year supply. Um, so it's a very good chance that someone, uh, wherever your clients may be buying or your prior clients may be buying, that they're actually in a council which doesn't have that uh, defendable supply. Now, Schlaf, does anyone know what Schlaf is? There's a sweets. Come on, anyone? Oh, come on, there's a big jar of sweets as a prize for this one. Oh, a whole jar. Oh, a whole jar. Nothing housing local authority. Housing plan. Really? So I said, yeah, you were closest, so you win this week. Right. It's a strategic housing land availability assessment. You also have a Sheila, which is a strategic housing and economic land assessment, or you can have a LAR, which is just a land availability assessment. The reason they exist, let's go back to Leeds, they were missing 2,000 plots, weren't they? What do they do? When they've looked at all their planning permissions, they've looked at their allocated sites, the only other thing they can do is have a call for sites, and that's exactly what they will have. It's a massive consultation they will write to every solicitor, every farmer, every state agent, surveyor, um, anybody who's on their database, top 10 house builders, local house builders, and they'll, they'll say to them all, have you got land in the, in the borough that you feel is suitable for development for either economic land, housing land, or for, suitable for gypsy encampments? Needs to say, loads of people throw their hat in the ring and say, quite happy for you to develop my land. Where it gets confusing is, let's look at this one here. This property here that somebody was buying, this was one of our reports, this is a 75 metre radius. And what we do is we study that area in three ways, past, present, future. We want to look at the past because we want to see where the precedent may have already been established. Uh, then we look to the present. Is there currently planning activity in this area? And then we look to the future. How would a developer study this area? Would a developer identify sites in this area that could be developed? So if you went to this council's uh, website and you went to look at the local plan, you would see that this is the settlement boundary. So everything here, there's a presumption in front of favor of development, but this is Greenbelt, where there's a strong presumption against development because it's in the Greenbelt. So instantly you may go to the, uh, the conclusion that well, the view to the south is safe. Go to the same council's website, look for their schla, and you'll then find that that area of land here is that. It's been promoted through the schla, it's found to be suitable, it's found to be deliverable, but there's no planning history on it. So if you just relied on planning data alone, it wouldn't have shown this up. In fact, what it would have shown is that, oh, it's Greenbelt, so you might think it's safe. So that is now a high-risk site. That view to the south is going to change. This is Oxford City. Uh, I picked on Oxford City uh, because it's the clearest schlag we found yet in the country. Everything here on the left, coloured pink, is land that has been volunteered for development and the council have considered it for development. Now the fact that, that all of that land has been considered is worrying enough because that shows intent. And once you can see that there's intent from a landowner, well, you now know what could be happening next door. But what popped out the other end was blue, unsuitable or undeliverable, yellow, suitable and deliverable. These are all high-risk sites dotted around Oxford City. 
if you look really, really carefully, which you probably can't do, there is lots of small little pockets of yellow all over the city. And then there's obviously these massive tracks where people think they've got lovely views over sort of green fields or open spaces and are all high risk. And you see that some of the scale of them is massive. So this is why schlars are so important to investigate. And we're proud to say we're the only firm in the country that does this. No one else does it. So you have two choices, or your clients have two choices. If they want to investigate these, do it themselves, or employ us. That's it. No, no other investors as yet. What is more worrying is the type of land that the councils are considering. This is Tandridge District Council, just south of Croydon, again. Um, <clears throat> this is an area I was actually born in this town, so I know this site very well. It's not very really clear on the graphic here, but this is a picture of this. It's shown on the OS as recreation ground. It's, it's a park. This is a fully equipped play area. Uh, there's <coughs> bins for your dog waste. It is maintained, it's flat, it's level, it's a park. But considered by Tandridge District Council in their staff, development of this site is considered to be achievable, deliverable, can be developed within five years. So it's really disturbing, and this is not an isolated case. We have seen numerous parks and play areas that are being considered by councils for development. Thornton, down in Somerset. The old settlement sort of sits around here. Everything colored pink or mauve or blue, to the north and the south has gone into the Schlar process. It's huge tracts of land because of this massive housing shortage uh, that, that Rachel was talking about. You know, the, the pledge from the central government to build houses, it's massive, and the pressure on the councils is forcing them to consider all of these sites. So this is one of our reports. This is an 80 pound report that includes the cost of the planning data, 80 pounds plus BAT. But here we identified on this semi-rural property actually sat about sort of here. Uh, on this map. This site, too, was found to be unsuitable, not deliverable, a low medium risk because you've still got a, a willing landowner here who's prepared to see it developed, and schlars will come in cycles. You might get this schlar, and then in five years' time, you might get another schlar, and the same landowner may put their site forward again, so it could be successful again in the future. The site one here was found to be suitable, that is a high risk site. So the front cover of our report, are there planning uh, developments of concern? Yes. Are views going to change? Yes. Is the area under threat from development? Yes. Is there a risk to a lender? Yes. So we make it very clear on the front cover what we found. We hope it will come back. But negligible and the answer is no, 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 no. That's what we want to do. But we don't really, in the nicest sense, care what it says. We just want to give you the God's honest truth and then someone can make an informed decision on what they do. There's a bit of uh, case uh, law that I wanted to mention as well. Thorpe versus Abbotts. Here, the purchaser's solicitor made a very reasonable uh, pre-purchase inquiry of the vendors, such as, are you aware of any development sites? The reply came back, no. They went ahead, exchanged, completed, moved in, and then found out there's a development site next door, and they're pretty miffed. They did some investigations. They found out that the previous owner was obviously consulted on this development by the council, as they naturally would be. Then they did some more investigations. They found out that the, the previous owner had objected to the development in written form with their name at the bottom, had even was on record of attending a public meeting against the development, but when it came to answering truthfully, they knew nothing about it. They completely set their minds. So they pursued them legally because of that misrepresentation, but failed to win because it came back to caveat emptor, by the way. So very disturbing for any solicitor who thinks they can rely on pre-purchase inquiries. Then we've got the headline case, which is why I phrase this as how to avoid being sued for two million, because that's exactly what happened to Bird and Bird. I'm going to take you through what exactly happened to Bird and Bird, why they were sued for two million pounds, a successful suit for two million pounds, um, and then I'm going to be really smug for about 30 seconds. So apologies for my smugness, <laughs> uh, but it will come clear. Um, right, this is the property. This is what Rebecca Chow, who was buying this, couple, uh, this property, she was buying it through a BVI registered company, Orinfield Holdings, it was an investment purchase. So the fact that it was an investment purchase, purchase takes all the emotions out of it. This is not somewhere where the Chows want to bring up their family and see their kids grow up. This is about making money. And that's very relevant, I think, in, in a damages uh, award. She employs Bird and Bird. Bird and Bird do a fantastic job. I'm not gonna pick on them at all, because they did do a thorough job. They bought every possible search report they could get their hands on. 
One of the reports they bought was Landmarks Plan Search Plus. The mistake they made was they went through Plan Search Plus themselves, advised the client nothing to worry about, and then didn't even email the PDF of the report to the client. That was the two mistakes they made. Had they have just said in an email, please find a tax, Plan Search Plus. This is outside our scope of works. Please read and let us know if you're happy to proceed. They've gone off the hook. They've been completely off the hook, but they tried to be thorough. Anyway, she exchanges contracts based upon the advice of Lauren Bird and then finds out that the college here is evolving into an academy. It's turning from about 700 students to about 1,400 students. There's going to be new seven story structures built. There was 44 houses built to the northern part of it as well. And she's so offended by it, she says, I'm not going to complete. So she's out of pocket, obviously, for her deposit and her costs. And as we now know, she pursued them and won because the judge said it was not up to Bird and Bird to conclude what is an acceptable development that is subjective. It is up to the fee paying clients. So that's why they won. Why I'm so smug is because this property had to be resold. Liz Murdoch bought it for 28 and a half million pounds, three and a half million pounds more than Rebecca Chow, which I think is very relevant to the damages because there would have been no loss. Had she have completed, put it back on the market, she could have sold it to Liz for three million pounds plus more and made a profit, that, which was her whole intention when she agreed to buy it. Why am I so smug? We did the report for Liz Murdoch. So, this was the same property, same planning data, but we marked it high risk. Are there planning, risks of, uh, planning sites of concern? Yes. Are views going to change? Yes. Is the area under threat for development? Yes. We know of it. We found it because we took the responsibility. We went through that planning data and we could find out uh, what was there. What was interesting though, we also identified four other sites. These three had live, unimplemented planning permissions for new build development. That these two here would have a greater impact on that property than the one she was worried about up there. That would not make a jot of difference to the value of that property. So, um, so yeah, so Liz Murdoch, their solicitors copped out 80 pounds plus that, and look how they were protected. <coughs> one of the other things we do with our reports though is where we find evidence, we attach the images. So it's a very visual report. So if there is a schlar, we take a screenshot of it and we put it into the appendix of the report. If we see a detailed planning permission for, uh, or an artist impression, we'll put that in the report. So it's very easy for perhaps the, um, the end user who is not uh, from a development background and may not understand plans. There's all the evidence there. There's the pictures. Look at the pictures and now you know what's going to be built next door. Bird and Bird appealed this uh, and failed to win. Um, there was something very interesting though that Lady Justice Gloucester said in her, uh, her summary, which was, if you're buying reports on behalf of clients, you should summarise these in your report on title. And of course, solicitors don't do that with a lot of reports because there is, there means they would have to report that, read them themselves, and then give a summary. We provide that summary. We provide on the second page of our report, uh, in our key findings, it's what I call the non-waffle box. It's where we get to the point and say, site one has a, a planning commission, it's for 80 houses, it's going to impact your property. These are real examples now. These are all sort of genuine case studies. This is in the Cotswolds area of outstanding natural beauty. This is not a defined settlement. It is all in the countryside, zoned as an AONB, one of the strongest uh, categorizations of land you can get. And yet, right in front of this property that they were looking to buy, that had obtained planning for that 50 odd houses. Why? Cotswolds don't have a defendable five year supply. This is down in Cornwall. This is in the middle of nowhere. If you zoomed out of that aerial image, you would continue to see nothing other but green fields. That has got planning for that 50 odd houses again, because Cornwall don't have an affordable, dependable five year supply. Uh, and we see this all the time. Schlars, this is another example of a schlar. Now, before we even identified that it was a high risk site, we had already identified it as a development site because. Look at the shape of this uh, settlement. It's, it's just a natural growth point for the town. We can see that, we can spot it a mile off. So we were already going to be identifying that as a risk, but when we looked into the shaft, we found, oh look, it's already been promoted. Green, suitable, deliverable. That's now a high risk site, but there's no planning application on it. So if you just relied on planning data, you would not have found that out. Uh, do anyone here deal with commercial clients? 
you do, good, I will mention this one as well. This is one of our premium reports. Premium reports don't search just a 75 meter radius, they search 75 meters on the boundaries of what someone is acquiring, so it's a much bigger area that we study and we go into a lot of detail. We go specifically into that five year uh, supply. What was relevant here, somebody was buying this commercial uh, unit uh, and it was the light industry and they had plans to expand. And so that would obviously in the future require a planning application. What we identified was site three here had been identified in Schlar and suitable for a housing development of 200 odd houses. That's 200 objectors to that planning application that they're gonna make in the future. So with our commercial uh, reports, we generally have a bit of a different spin on it. It's not as emotive it is as Mr. and Mrs. Smith falling in love with that little cottage in the leafy suburbs of Leeds. This is someone who's making a financial investment and needs to know what could affect that financial uh, investment for the business. One of the worst we found uh, was down not far from Gatwick Airport, and it was so bad, um, we went to the estate agent's uh, web page and wanted to see how they were describing this property. They described it as, the property is set within a secluded location in a popular meat green area. This is the secluded meat green area, 2,000 homes being built, and that was right bang in the middle of it. It was surrounded on all four sides by development. Um, and yet it hadn't been divulged. What did the buyer do? Run for the hills. It was a complete waste of time. Um, everyone's disappointed, but uh, again, hadn't been disclosed by the nice, honest estate agent. Here, this is where planning data, and I'm not picking on planning data, quite the opposite. Planning data is vital to our reports, but this just goes to show this is a landmark, new build, over 50 dwellings, no applications within 750 metres. Absolutely factually correct. There have been no applications, but that's in the shop, right at the bottom of the garden for 200 homes. This is why the shards are going to just keep running this down, but you know, they're so critical. This is my non-PC slide. Um, I'm going to wager a bet. We have no gypsies in the room, so I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> um, right. Behind this property, if there is, please say no. <laughs> um, behind this property is land called the Nook, and it was identified as a candidate site for our gypsy traveling friends. It was one of 12 candidate sites. It had made it into the last two. So it's now 50-50. So what does the solicitor tell their client? Should we toss a coin on it? Could be good news, could be bad news. No, they're gonna run for the hills. Um, because whether it's wrong or right, I'm not gonna comment on actually. But it is just a matter of valuation fact. That is plummeting in value, bordering on unmarketable. And there's no way the bank would lend on it. So although we have marked it as a refer to lender, actually by the time they told Mr. and Mrs. Smith we were buying that property, they're saying, oh, don't bother telling the lender, we're withdrawing anyway. But if they did go ahead, they would get their driveway regularly tarmacked. So. <laughs> 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 the same circumstances here. This was outside the 75 metres, we would still mention it. We would not be cruel enough to mention, not mention something if we can score brownie points with the solicitor. And this tickled me, this was actually on the Daily Mail online. Gypsy family slams council spending one million pounds on a caravan site claiming we don't want travellers here. So even they don't want them to be in. Now, five-year housing supply. This is why it's critical interpretation of planning histories of property that is so important. This was somebody buying a barn. They were buying this barn for about one and a quarter million. It was surrounded by these fields here. So it's a very pretty uh, location. But the planning history, the planning data revealed that right next door, sharing two of its boundaries, there was planning history for this very large development. It was refused by the council and the uh, uh, applicant appealed that decision and the inspector concluded that the appeal should be dismissed. So do you think it's now safe? Well, it wasn't because you got to look at the actual reasons for the dismissal. And the reasons for the dismissal was the council has a defendable five-year supply. When we looked at the five-year supply, it was 5.2 years, very, very marginal. You take a sudden downturn in the market, houses not being built, look at Brexit, look at the impact that's having on the housing market. Suddenly, they fall behind with their five-year supply. What's the developer gonna do? Reappear, resubmit. The council now has no defendable reason to refuse that application because they can't raise new issues. They can only raise <coughs> the one issue the inspector allowed them to 
which was the five-year supply. Now that's been dealt with, has to be approved. So that is still a relatively high-risk site. It's a need, we would have to call it a medium high-risk site. Now they can make an informed decision whether they still go ahead. This was uh, a two-up, two-down cottage, um, end of terrace, sort of uh, here. This view taken from the roundabout is from here. So the flank wall of that property is what you can just about see here. The property they were buying, lovely views over the local park, big leafy trees here. What did we find out? Well, Woking and Borough Council want to reduce the amenity area of that park to one third of its original size. They want to build housing on the northern and western boundaries. And this is a lovely shiny Asda they're putting here. And that's the same property there. So that's actually its view. Uh, all those trees, as you can see here, they're going to be removed to make way for the parking. Um, again, refer to lender. Um, and all of these plans would have been attached into the report, uh, again. Now, of all the slides I've shown you, I hope this is the one that you will remember, because this is a true uh, case, story, uh, case study of one of our clients in East Anglia. Now, he was aware of our product, Mr. Lister, and he loves our product, but he didn't want to impose the cost on his clients. So he put three options into his client care letter. Option A, we would like you to give us 80 pounds plus VAT, so we will commission a specialist report from Devasys that will do X, Y, and Z. Option B, if you're too tight to give me 80 pounds plus VAT, give me 35 pounds and I'll get you plan search plus and you're gonna to have to read it yourself. Option C, do nothing at all. She went for option B, she thought, oh, let's go the line in the middle. So he sends her landmarks plus, unlike Bird and Bird, he did the right thing, he emailed it to her, said, please read this. She went ahead and completed. She then finds out, directly opposite the house that she's buying, there's this three-story education block being built, and she's really miffed. This is her real uh, letter of complaint that reads, I was shocked to receive a letter from Churchill College about planned development on the land opposite my new home. Discovered that a planning application was made on January the 14th. I checked the search about planning applications you supplied in March, copy enclosed, which made no mention of this. The consequences of this development, blah, 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 what happens? That is not someone saying, oh, in hindsight, I was a bit tired, wasn't I? I should have gone for option A. No, she's still blaming the solicitor, probably because she never actually read the, the T's and C's that the solicitor would have given them on day one. So I said to the solicitor, can you please send me the exact planning data that you emailed on to her, and I want to do a retrospective report on it. We went through Landmarks Plan Search Plus, lo and behold, it was in there. She missed it. And she may have missed it for three reasons. Um, she got bored, lost the will to live reading it because it is just pages and pages and pages of planning data. Um, or was it because it was incorrectly geocoded? And this isn't Landmark's fault, I'm not going to pick on them. It's how an, uh, a local authority will geocode an application to an XY point. They don't code it effectively to the site boundaries. So here is the site plan that the uh, applicant submitted. Edged in red is the site. Edged in blue are the land within the applicant's control. So they've geocoded it 220 metres to the northwest, which was where the college is based. This is the HQ, if you like. So that's where it was geocoded. So maybe she said, oh, 220 metres, like, nothing to worry about. We knew there was something to worry about because it's large open spaces. If this room was 100 acres, I want to build a house here, it could be geocoded anywhere in this room. So you've got to be very careful when you read planning data, which is why let us take the risk. It's our PI on the line, not the solicitors. For commercial, um, this was a property, this was somebody taking a restaurant lease. Uh, this is Piccadilly Circus in London. Um, so they're taking a restaurant lease, commissioned one of our reports. We found these two massive sites. The facade is, is being retained, um, but behind that retained facade was going to be a mixed use development. There was going to be retail, there was going to be uh, uh, entertainment attractions, there was going to be uh, some employment there as well. Fantastic news for a, for a commercial entity here, which is relying on bums on seats. This is really, really good news. But the critical document we found was that, and that was the road closure. This road was going to be closed for a period of six months while that and that were being built for safety reasons. Now, suddenly, no one's walking past his restaurant. So that's why it's critical, critical information. Um, that's there for my note. It just reminded me of, um, we, we did a report on, and, and we found that there was an application for a pub. Our premium report will go into a bit more detail. We don't just want to know, oh, it's going to be a pub. We want to know what type of pub it's going to be. It could be Malmaison coming in or it could be Weathersmoons. And there's a very different type of, of customer between Malmaison and Weathersmoons. 
as one of my clients in uh, uh, Newmarket said, when I mentioned where the street is, she said, oh, God, that's the waiting room for our criminal department. <laughs> <laughs> So we use that. That's what we look at. Hidden, hidden value. Um, hidden value is here. Uh, this was a, a housing association client who were referred to us by a solicitor. The, the phone call went, we've got access to someone's uh, back garden um, and they want to build a garage at the bottom of the garden. Could you value the grant of access? And they're like, yeah, sure, send us through a plan and have a look at it. So she sent through this plan. I phoned her back 30 seconds later and said, don't grant it. They, they were expecting on the market three or four grand for the grants of access. And we looked at it and said, well, that's got development potential. That's probably worth 150 grand. Mm -hmm. And yet you could sterilize it for the future by granting its access. And of course, they were so shocked, they sent us all of their land assets then, and we had to audit through the lot to find out what other value they were sitting on. Uh, I've missed this, I'm very conscious of time. So we do have a probate product that works for our sisters. If you ever do have sisters that deal in both, it's this very simple product. It looks at the asset, the land asset, and we look at it, has this got hidden value? Because if there is hidden value there, and it's not correctly reported when it goes through probate, they could be at risk. The reason we know that is that we had a client in Cardiff whose practice were fined 8,000 pounds by HMRC because the district valuer said it was undersold and it had hope value. Horrible term. Views are a big motivation when people buy, but what could go wrong with a water view? Well, these very high value properties here in London Docklands, we're going to see this, a 600 bed floating permanently moored hotel here. And that's gonna block the view. Oh. The impact of that was going to be huge because people didn't see it because it doesn't exist yet. It does now, because one of our solicitor clients phoned us up and said, go and have a look at the Daily Mail online. Here it is, it's been towed up the River Thames, it's been built in Holland, it's taken years to build, and it's now permanently moored outside these properties are now taking 25% off the value of their property. We do that because when you go to Zoopla, you can see prices being sold. Flats at the rear that didn't have water views were selling at 350. Flats on the water side were selling at 500. This is my favorite now. This was a report we did a couple of weeks back. It was so bad, I jumped in the car the following day because I wanted to go and see it in the flesh. So it was down in Folkestone, uh, in Kent, uh, and I wanted to see if there was any visible uh, notice on the land of what could be happening in this area in the future. There was nothing. Uh, and that's, that's the photo I took when I was down there. So what did we find? It was a grade two listed flat in this old uh, terrace here. But these are grade two listed. There's another crescent of them here. They were grade two listed. Beautiful sea views. State home by it's not exactly the Maldives, is it? But it, it's, uh, it, nevertheless, there is a sea view there that they can enjoy. What did we identify? Well, firstly, the car park here, which it has views over the rear, that was identified in the Schlar. Suitable, deliverable, going to be a risk of the rear. What staggered us was the beach. Planning consent for a thousand flats. Wow. Um, how do you build on a beach? You know, it was just, we just weren't seeing this one coming at all. Because, and it, it actually, you had to go through the historical mapping data to find out that used to be a Victorian amusement park. But now it's just covered by the beach. So everybody thinks that this is, you know, Effectively, public open space where you can go, but no. And the flat actually sits in this block here. So you can see there's rows of flats all the way up. And we've now actually had a run of loads of other reports in these same blocks here, because obviously words got out of what we've identified. Brighton, not far from where we're based. What could go wrong with a sea view? Again, well, this is Brighton Marina here. That's existing. This is a CGI of what's being proposed. 900 odd flats, 40 story tower, rising out of the sea, locals going for listed. And I was scratching my head going, why don't you know about this? That has been in the public domain for two decades. Two decades this has been discussed, but when the planning application comes in, oh my God, we didn't know that. And, and yet it was all information that was available. If we stick with Brighton, we've got the I360 down there. It's the Brexit of Brighton. It's divided uh, the city to those that love it and those that hate it. I think it's wonderful. But a friend, of my, a friend of my daughter's lives in this flat here, and they're selling it because they're so offended by this that's being built in front of them, they want to move it to Eastbourne where they've got an uninterrupted sea view. <laughs> Sticking with Brightwood, this is the old King Alfred Leisure Centre, and this is what my first employer, Chris Nicholson, was looking to do. Four 15-storey towers um, built along here. Everyone's kicking off here because they think they're losing their frontline properties and their sea views. 
Again, I'm scratching my head because that has been in the public domain longer than I have been in the development industry. Over three decades that's been discussed. So, these are the reports. That's the key box, the, the summary box I told you about. I explained what the front cover is. This is the main page. Every site we identify is measured, then we can give a density prediction. We can then mark it as a low risk, a high risk, um, but we always balance that with impact because risk is a horrible word, isn't it? But we want to say, yeah, it's a high risk site, but don't worry about it. It's gonna have no impact at all on your property. So just calm down, don't worry. So we always balance it with impact. We explain the zoning of the property, the development potential of the subject property, and then here is where we get into the nuts and bolts. Site one has planning consent form 80 flats, it will in the actual view. Um, and then the evidence is all attached in the appendix, so if there's any images, we then attach them. It doesn't matter whether your preference is landmark or ground shore, we work with both companies, we've got a great relationship with both. Uh, it is up to you or your clients to decide which one you would want us to go through and interpret that data. The premium reports are different. Um, this was quite interesting because the, the property fell into Woke, um, not Woke, Windsor. Uh, and Maidenhead Council because the front door was in Windsor and Maidenhead Borough Council. But the front garden fell into Bracknell Council. Bracknell don't have a five year supply. Windsor and Maidenhead do, so it was straddled. And it turned out that the field directly to the south of this very high value uh, manor house was being proposed for 2,200 homes. Uh, definitely an impact on that property. City location is our most expensive report because it is very, very labour intensive for us to go through. But when we get into central city locations, you're looking for different types of risk. It's not necessarily new build, it could be property modification. So for instance, in High Valley London, we're seeing basements all the time. The scale of them is massive. This is part of the tube map, the overground railway system. Um, and it's actually red because it's an allocated site. Well, how do you allocate a by railway? Very easy, it's in a cutting, you put a slab across the top, turn it into a tunnel, build on top of it. You can do that in High Valley London, you won't get away with that in Norwich or Plymouth. So you don't need to order these reports in, in those type of cities, but certainly when you get to the big ones, the Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, etc., it's a very, very vital report. Basements, they're massive, the scale of them in London, and we're starting to see this sort of epidemic expand into Birmingham and Manchester now. And this is why they're so important. This is Duffy's old house in Camden. That's what it looked like, and that's what it looked like 10 seconds later. Uh, it literally fell into its own basement. Now, the question I always pose to solicitors is, don't think about your client buying that one. What if your client has just exchanged contracts on that one? That's now an unsafe structure. The bank are not gonna be advancing the completion monies now. Um, they're in a legal nightmare. Even if it was a cash purchase, they're living in rented accommodation or a hotel for the next year while that property is made safe. We could have pointed it out because we would have checked the neighbouring properties. Eden Square, one of the highest value areas in, in uh, City of Westminster, this property had two basements either side of it being proposed. And that's the scale of it. That's going deeper than the original footings of that property. Um, definitely a risk to a landlord. And you know, basements that probably they're causing these soft spots because they're upsetting the water courses, the natural water courses that are already under the ground, uh, subsidence and cracks, etc. And then we've got a simple product probate which just looks at the asset. Does it have some form of hidden value? So they're the main properties. Turnaround times, five days for this. This is suitable for small resi, small commercial, can't be bothered clients. If they're buying larger resi, larger commercial, or risk averse clients, that's the product they should go for. It is 250 quid if they're too tight for that, and at least they can be offered that one there. But that's the report we like doing because we literally lift every stone we possibly can. We look at all the data, and we couldn't have done this 20 years ago because data didn't exist on the internet. This amazing discovery of mine is that the internet is not just for pornography. You can <laughs> find out other things on the internet, and it's, it's quite staggering. Um, Never says premium, um, that's, so that's 250 plus bad, large resi, large commercial, risk of those clients. Dev City, 500 pounds, five day turnaround, five day turnaround, that's three days, that's five days. They can be fast tracked if you've got a demanding client. Um, clients say lovely things, I won't bother you with that, but a lot of clients start ordering one or two, and then they realize, and then they make it a mandatory report because it really does expose so much. Worst area in the country is currently Manchester. 42% of our reports have a high risk in that 75 metre radius. 
Uh, Cambridge is also quite bad at 31%, one in three. Um, so it does depend where you are in the country. If you go to somewhere perhaps like, uh, 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 where was that? I think it was Norwich, 8.2, so it's a relatively low. Why? Because it's a poorer city and it sees less investment. So there's me done. Uh, but this was a lovely quote from Brendan, uh, who's a barrister in Bristol. I suspect that your services will become a standard requirement for all solicitor comparison searches. We're trying to work with the Law Society, the dinosaur that it is, to try and get them to realise what we were doing are able to expose, but uh, that's still work in progress. But I went through a really rapid pace because I tried to cover an awful lot, so you'll be glad to know I've finished. Quite happy to take any questions now or in the, in the break, but uh, thank you for listening.